Good afternoon. Higher academic standards. Um, a topic you wouldn't think would be very controversial, would you? But it's getting a lot of attention across the country these days. And I've been asked to sort of give a background for a, a conversation that will uh, follow this presentation. Uh, so uh, just as you noted in the introduction, um, I'm not a, uh, simply an observer of this process that's been underway, but directly involved uh, as one, a chief state school officer in Kentucky during the early stages of thought around this and then uh, heading the uh, Council of Chief State School Officers during the time of, of development. It's a fairly recent um, initiative uh, in this country. Um, this gives you a sense of fr from beginning to end in the process that went underway, but we didn't begin to take action as states on this issue until 2007, at, uh, in the, actually the fall of that. I, I could get a little footnote to this. I, um, I did make a presentation to them in October prior, in the prior year, uh, asking states to step up and do what I call their rightful responsibility in setting standards for this country. Uh, but uh, it gained support and momentum to a much higher degree than I thought it would uh, among the states. Uh, as you can see, uh, 48 states were involved in the writing of those standards. Uh, someone asked me early on in the process what I do, would define as success in terms of state participation, and I said, well, it would be wonderful if we could get 24 to 25 of the states, near half of the states engaged in this process. The reason for that thinking being uh, that would give us enough to test this out uh, and to move forward to learn from those experiences and then uh, test that among the others. But that was not the case. So we had at one point uh, widespread uh, support for the process, engagement in lots of states, and then uh, the reality of implementation, as always, uh, begins to play. This, though, was not the beginning of this um, conversation about standards. It didn't begin with the states. Um, I don't know if any of you remember this uh, report or not, but it was uh, during Ronald Reagan's administration. Actually, the first national report about this issue of um, need for standards. Uh, there's a famous quote in there, if, if a nation uh, were to face this kind of situation, that being the deplorable condition of, of uh, student academic success in this country, uh, we would declare war on that nation. So it was a very direct and pointed conversation about the lack of rigor in American public education. That goes all the way back, as it says here, to 1983. But following that, then, um, we saw a number of national reports that really pointed to the need for uh, higher standards um, in this country. Uh, I've noted three of them here. There were a number of others, but the disciplines began to rethink their own positions about what they were asking students to do, the most notable one being the teachers of mathematics. But we also saw the report from America's Choice High Skills Low Wages, which pointed out the international competition that was emerging in this country, the lack of preparedness of American youngsters to take on high skill jobs, the impending competition that's coming uh, to the United States from other countries, the business community, remember at this time, was going through deep reflection and uh, redeployment of resources, redesigning their systems, and the education system was going on as it had gone on for many, many years. So the lack of alignment with those systems uh, was um, important. Um, uh, Governor, uh, or President, Governor of Texas, and then President George Bush then issued uh, this report on the National Goals Panel. It was an attempt by the federal government to set up a group, a body that would come out with a set of goals. All of that failed. And I think partly because uh, most people didn't want at that time and still don't want the federal government uh, determining education goals. We have a strong history in this country of states' responsibility for education. And so there was generally and this was not a partisan issue. It was a part of both Republican and Democratic administrations over the years, but um, uh, it never did really 
catch hold uh, as, a, as an impetus uh, coming from uh, the federal government. Um, then um, the governors got involved. And I know you all probably remember names like uh, uh, Hunt of North Carolina, um, uh, Clinton of Arkansas, um, Alexander in Tennessee, uh, Winter in Mississippi, um, Weld in Massachusetts, a whole array of governors began to talk about and to face this reality of the economic shift that was going on in the country. That was the driver for this conversation. Uh, these governors knew that their future, the future of their state, literally rest in their ability to transform uh, their economic base. And if they didn't do so, uh, they faced uh, peril. Uh, some states grabbed this initiative and moved uh, aggressively. Uh, many states struggled. You can notice a number of those names I had on the uh, a list that I just laid out were southern states, uh, states that were facing uh, dire economic circumstances and a need to upgrade dramatically to catch up with some of the east and west coast kinds of developments. But at the same time the governors were wrestling with these issues, um, a number of reports uh, began to uh, flood the country. A number of think tanks like Fordham Institute uh, began to point out uh, in a number of reports uh, the uh, dire situation as they saw it. Achieve Inc. was formed, which was an organization of governors and business people coming together uh, to drive a stronger agenda. We had a number of international studies that came forward comparing U.S. results with other countries. Uh, most of those reports followed this theme. We were once at the top of the nations in the world. We are now, and then fill in the blank, anywhere from 15 to 30 uh, in terms of ranking on different kinds of uh, scales. So we had then, in this country, a number of situations that were um, pushing us forward. And then No Child Left Behind came along. And strangely, seven years past uh, the date of renewal, we're still operating under No Child Left Behind. Uh, this has been the federal law that drives education policy uh, uh, over the, the many uh, years that uh, I was at the council and as a chief here in Kentucky. Um, but it did some good things. Uh, it really came with uh, uh, the Texas reform uh, uh, and out of that reform, I think on this uh, list of accomplishments and goals and achievements, it was soft on many things, but it did ask states to begin to think about things like how are you holding folks accountable what kinds of assessments are you using? But it also instituted a number of things that were uh, necessary in this country. One, we have to disaggregate student achievement for the first time. Most states weren't doing that. That is, if I had poor kids and rich kids, if I had uh, students of color and, uh, and white kids, if I had a mix of English language speakers and non-English language speakers, there was no way for the public to generally know how each of those subgroups were performing. States just simply were not breaking their data down in a way that the public could understand. And it did surface, began to surface, some real disparate achievement results based on a number of those factors. It also asked us to uh, issue public report cards about the status of schools. It asked us to begin to intervene in low-performing schools. It began to talk about our uh, uh, responsibility to develop growth models or targets for students. All of this is good. But um, it was very, very um, um, prescriptive. All of the states had to do all of the things in there. And that critic happens to be standing in front of you. But one critic has said uh, that it was sort of wrongheaded in terms of what it was asking states to do. Um, it didn't l deal with what students should know and be able to do. A state could continue to set very low standards and in effect, think of what's going on here. Two states, one setting very high standards, another state setting very low standards. Guess who wins under this system? 
If I set very low standards, then I have fewer schools deemed in need of improvement. If I set very low standards, I don't have a huge performance gap between uh, high achievers and low achievers. If I set very low standards, I don't have the kind of rigor that I need in terms and the drive to improve the teaching and learning process in our schools. So we had, quote, states that really set low standards. In fact, you could be a neighbor of a state and you could literally walk from one borderline to the other state and you would change your definition of what uh, uh, adequacy and proficiency is in those two states. So uh, we had um, a number of states that were in literally gaming that system. So we weren't doing the right things uh, for the students in this country generally. It was a good driver. But uh, again, we avoided the issue of standards. And so um, that's, uh, I left Kentucky in, uh, and in 2007, uh, my first presentation to the chiefs was that this no longer should be tolerated among the states. Uh, shame on us. Uh, if we really are serious about the education of our children across this country, we have to step up and be held accountable uh, for these students. And the first step in that is for us to declare what we think students should know and be able to do in order to be successful in this country. And that was an interesting challenge for many states because you had to admit to this point, things were not being openly uh, presented to the public in a way they should have been. So um, I think the final straw that brought attention to this is uh, Margaret Spelling, uh, Secretary of Education under uh, Bush, issued what she called the wall chart. Uh, and it literally was taking the results of the National Assessment of Education Progress, which is the nation's report card. Uh, we sample students across the, all the states uh, uh, regularly on the cycles and we report the results of those on a scale from proficiency down to basic. And the states were at the same time issuing their reports on how well students were doing uh, on their state assessments. And basically, what we were defining as proficient at the state level was basic on NAEP. There were very few students who were reaching those expectations that were being set uh, by this national report card. So, as I said earlier, uh, there was um, uh, basically um, a number of factors that came to play that, I, uh, that caused 48 states to say, we'll, we'll, we'll jump in on this and see what we can do. Um, and it was because of these factors. Uh, we were not happy with the way things were operating under NCLB. Uh, we, all of us were going through regular processes of setting standards, and yet the standards that resulted from those processes were inferior uh, to what they ought to be. Um, we were getting uh, attacked, literally, by comparative scores of student achievement from other parts of the world. And when you start getting compared to North, uh, South Korea and uh, other places like that, it's one thing uh, to be uh, compared to England or to uh, uh, advanced nations, but we were now performing at uh, the second tier of nations or below them. And um, we really weren't, here's the irony, we were not happy with the Fed setting standards, which I'll get back to here in a moment. But we thought if anybody in this country should set the standard, it ought to be the states. So we went about the business of setting these standards. Here's what we were trying to do. Uh, we thought um, a couple things in that first point. The two critical uh, subjects for students entering college or going into careers are English language arts and mathematics. If we could reach agreement on those two areas, then we would probably be able to affect the others. All other subjects do uh, expand from those two. If a student cannot read, cannot interpret what they're reading, it plays over in social studies and science and other disciplines. If you can't do mathematics, it's a gateway to a set of disciplines that uh, uh, in business or in a college are critical to success. When we looked at those standards uh, uh, that were developed by the states, 
uh, they had some big problems. One, they were low. Uh, there were expectations of students that uh, literally were of middle school, high school, uh, was not uh, on par with, uh, with those high school requirements. Um, the, they were full of all kinds of expectations. Um, teachers literally could not teach the standards. There were so many of them. And the, re the reason for that, you bring a group of teachers together, you find the best teachers to do this work, you engage them in a process of setting standards, and they all lay on the table all the things they think are important in a discipline, and what you end up with is this plethora of expectations for students. We've done some analyses, and it would take teachers literally years and years and years to teach what was inside those state standards. It was confusing to them, so what do you do? They call it a, um, a mile wide and an inch deep in terms of expectations was the phrase that was being used. And then third, clear. We started reading those. I would have no idea what I was supposed to do if I were a teacher. They were so broad in language, so, so nebulous that it was difficult to interpret. We had never gone through an evidence base about what, how one links to career success and, um, and to college success and developed a set of standards that tried to get to that level. We had not, no state had done a good job of developing progressions that would uh, help students understand and teachers understand and parents understand what it was, the prerequisite skills that lead to the next level of skills that lead to the next le level of skills. That sequence was missing. And uh, then the high-performing states like Massachusetts, we made a guarantee to them that they wouldn't lower their standards. We would be as high as the highest in the country. That's what we were trying to do um, in this process. So we did make these shifts. And where did these come from? We had conversations with the two primary consumers of our students, the business community and colleges of higher education. We went to those folks and asked them, what would it take for a student to enter college and maintain a, in a credit-bearing course, not a remediation course, maintain a C or better? What would be the skills that those students would have to possess? We went to the business and said, what would it take to enter a career where there was a promise of a future and a, and a basic uh, standard of living to support a family? Uh, they gave us those answers. Those became the basis for the standards. Uh, those were the conversations we had with those two communities. Uh, and then secondly, uh, we began to think about what would it mean in terms of mathematics and then what would it mean in terms of uh, English language arts. And these are the three things that those standards do, basically. If you boil it down, what's inside those national standards right now? They are focus, uh, that is, don't spread students out in mathematics instruction to the point where they do not understand the basic concepts that you're talking about. What does this mean? It means that the elementary curriculum is really focused on, on addition, subtraction, understanding the basic concepts of mathematics. One of the reasons students fall out of mathematics at the middle and high school level is they never did master the basic concepts of mathematics. So take away all that other language and let's focus on what's important and let's sequence those things so we can know where students are in that mathematical process and bring them along. If you don't build that basic knowledge at the elementary level, then you are not gonna be able to begin to think about uh, these two other issues of how one thinks about how each of those are developed across the grades and then how they are, are, are linked in terms of major topics. The real important part of mathematics is not the higher education, uh, the higher level at the secondary level. It is building that three through eight kind of curriculum that builds the co uh, capacity of the students to think uh, mathematically. And then uh, tying together this idea of conceptual understanding. So you start with basic mathematics principles at the elementary level at those very, very uh, basic levels, and then by the time they get to high school, they're dealing uh, with these conceptual understandings uh, that are necessary to use mathematics well. In English language arts, um, read complex texts. We found out that students were reading uh, 
less than prior generations, and we found that they were reading at lower levels. And sadly, that got worse as they progressed through the grades. Um, at the high school level is the most obvious uh, deficit in this context. And be able to use uh, what's in text in an academic way. Um, we ask students to write and to express themselves without having to rely on the evidence in the text. Uh, what do you do when you get to college? Uh, you're in trouble if you can't use this skill. Uh, they don't care what you did on your summer vacation. <laughs> they want to know how you can take the information that's basic to that uh, discipline and write from and express views of authors and to draw conclusions from that. Uh, and then we found that we're not, we were not teaching nonfiction uh, writing uh, in, in the uh, grades to the degree we need to. That is, lots of fiction. Uh, there are lots of reasons for that, but basically we ask for a balance because when you get into collegeing, you get into careers, this, this is the critical skill uh, that most of you are looking for. So those are the shifts. That's it. If you boil everything down to it, that doesn't seem like a controversial issue, does it? 48 states and D.C. did it. 38 now have adopted those standards, and the other states have developed standards that are similar to uh, those standards. Um, we have, as a country, successfully elevated the expectations of our students. The new benchmark is college and career ready uh, for all students. That puts a tremendous pressure on the public school system, but it's the right position to take. If you do not graduate with these kinds of skills today, the harsh reality is that life's gonna be very difficult for you, both economically and uh, personally. And so the states are moving in this direction. So why is this thing so controversial? That, what I've just described, ought to be um, something that most people would say, hey, that makes sense, why don't we do that? that this, is, this is an improvement in the system. But it's become an extremely controversial topic uh, in this country today. Uh, and I think this first one on the list is the one that most people are citing. Um, that is, this is the beginning of greater federal intervention in uh, states' educational systems. And um, the feds have been interested in this a long time. Uh, there has been federal money, although the standards process had no engagement of the, of the federal government in it at all. It was all state run and, and supported by uh, philanthropy. Uh, the feds had no voice nor money in that development of the standards process. But they have invested in assessments since that process, and that leads folks to be suspicious. I think it's a spillover of general suspicion of the federal government on a lot of fronts these days, uh, health care, other kinds of the um, issues that are around with privacy and of data and those kinds of things have caused the public to begin to think about how much do we want the feds engaged in our lives. And because they are as a fear of this, um, that has become a major issue. It has become political. Uh, folks taking positions on various sides of this issues. Secondly, some folks say they're not rigorous enough. I uh, wish they would read, you could read those and see if you, what you think about this. Uh, uh, comes mostly in the area of mathematics. Some folks in, folks in Kentucky are saying that they ought to really teach trigonometry and um, calculus. Uh, for, uh, remember, these were written for all students. The harsh reality is you don't need those two disciplines for many careers today, but you do need a solid grounding in mathematics. Uh, uh, so that debate will go on. That's a healthy debate. We need to have that conversation. Um, some people say, well, why we pick those two out? I've explained that those are gateway uh, disciplines for other disciplines, but other people want uh, standards and uh, states coming together in these other areas. Uh, we're just not going to do that uh, as a, uh, a national effort. Um, folks say standards aren't sufficient. They pull out reports that indicate data that uh, the um, system is no longer uh, sufficient for uh, uh, curriculum is more important, instruction is more important, of course it is. Uh, and no one said that the standards are important. Um, teaching to test, actually the, the standards do not 
to advocate teachings to test. Uh, you teach to standards, to the outcomes you expect. So we got to have standards. I think without this baseline of standards in this country, we're in trouble. Uh, we could, we've seen what happens when uh, we don't come together around rigorous standards and a commitment. I think that uh, every youngster deserves uh, a set of expectations that are realistic and uh, lead towards success. Uh, I think uh, we need to keep this as a state initiative. I can't guarantee that the feds won't try to get into it. All I can say is that we're, we're um, uh, interested in that not occurring. Um, of course, we've got other things to do here. We have to develop curricula around this. Standards are not curriculum. Of course, we have to have teacher preparation. Of course, we have to do a number of other things. But I just want to end by saying, and then if anybody has any questions, or I may not have covered everything that's on your mind. We can do that for a moment. But um, I appreciate the voice of business in this conversation. And, and I just adhere you, you. Do not let this opportunity pass. Uh, whether you call it the Common Core Standards or whatever you do, we cannot afford to retreat as a country. Uh, we're not in great shape in terms of our college uh, going rates, the success of students who get to college. You're not happy with the kinds of skills that, that these young people are bringing to uh, the careers when you employ them. Uh, our country's future rests on this, and more importantly, their personal lives rest on their ability to be successful. They, so say something about this that you feel, but again, don't give up on this idea of having strong standards and support your states as they do move forward um, around them. So we have a few moments. Uh, I hope somebody may take me on. I like doing that. Uh, and um, I would uh, address any issue that you were thinking about before you came into this session and I didn't happen to touch on as a background uh, to the conversation. First of all, let me, uh, let me thank you for sharing this information. I'm a strong supporter of Common Core, so I appreciate uh, all of the leadership and tenacity that you put into making this happen. But I have two questions. Um, even though you share what some of the arguments are against common culture, I'm still struggling with that. I can't see why this isn't a no-brainer that everybody should move in that, in that way. However, it sounds like it's taken a very long time for us to get the first round of Common Core. I would think that we would need to be going back and 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 maybe altering or changing those, those standards on some regular basis because technology changes at a pretty alarming pace. Mm -hmm. And if we don't keep up with that 15 years from now, we'll be having the same discussion. I'd like to hear your thoughts about a process that mm -hmm. makes this something that's natural to happen or is there one that already exists? And then my second question was in your slide, you mentioned that 38 states had already adapted it as such. But you said except for the WICHE oh, states. Oh, higher education collaboratives. That was the reference, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, I was trying to understand what that meant. Um, on, the, on this issue of um, arguments against, again, uh, my sense is that it is not about the substance of the standards themselves. Uh, other than the one argument that they ought to be more rigorous uh, than they are right now. That seems to be falling on deaf ears. Uh, most people reading those standards understand they're higher than what we've had in the past, and that will play out even more directly when states begin to administer assessments against those standards, which will occur this next year. Uh, the harsh reality is there are going to be fewer students who are proficient under these new standards than have been in the past under state assessments for a couple of reasons. One, they are higher. Two, these tests are more rigorous than they've been before. The real difference in the, co in the Common Core standards and the prior state standards is the level of skill required of students. Yes, there are some differences in the content sequencing, and it's, it's clear, but the real difference is what one does with that knowledge. That's the key skill. You know it is. 
uh, in, uh, in the world today. Can a student synthesize information? Can they think critically? Can they express uh, ideas from multiple points of view? Can you take an idea uh, that is a problem that's unresolved and solve it through prior knowledge? Those are the skills that are really being called for. So it's going to be tougher. But against, I think it's mostly political right now. I think people are reading these things, or not reading these things, and, and coming up with lots of different cases against. The irony in all this is the teachers love them. Uh, we have an outstanding response from the teaching corps across the country. It's created a lot of energy that we didn't have before. The teachers have, are beginning to redesign their professional development. So while we have this negative kind of political uh, cloud, we have, at the same time, an energized education workforce in this country uh, moving forward rapidly. Um, and then on the issue of, of rewriting. Our thought is, yes, we agree, totally. And we wanted to give these standards a time to be implemented. And, and we think the best test against that is the, um, is the actual uh, attempt to teach to those standards by teachers. And so we're trying to draw from those teachers what works, what doesn't work, why it doesn't work, didn't work. It can be that we got something wrong in there and we should make adjustments as we move forward and we will do so. Um, and there is probably a five-year cycle that we're trying to talk uh, through uh, to, in order to give adequate time before the field begins. You don't want to change the standards before the teachers get, become a, a, a aware and adept at teaching to those standards. You want to give them time to play out. So that's sort of the, the thinking right now. I wanted to echo, first of all, uh, what Mr. James said. Thank you for your commitment to this and diving in to ensure that students will not only learn, but they will know. And the depth yeah. of learning will have socioeconomic impact locally, yeah. statewide, nationally, internationally. So thank you. It's, it's a yeah. lot of work. And thank you for that. Yeah. Um, knowing that there is such rigor to this, and I agree absolutely that is needed, but also knowing that it has been so um, drastically different from state to state. What kind of support is there for the teachers mm -hmm. and for administrators as they have to begin to pull everybody up uh, to this level? Um, how is that support locally and, and is there yeah. national support for that as well? Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question. And, and the secret to the standards becoming real is really in this implementation process that's underway. Frankly, it's, it's scattered. Uh, uh, some states have done an outstanding job of building tools uh, for teachers and developing professional development opportunities. Kentucky's done a good job with this. Uh, we have a lot of teacher networks. One of the developments out of this is the c bringing the mathematicians together, higher education, as well as K-12 folks in learning in communities, uh, forming them inside school districts and then connecting them across districts. Uh, that's wonderful networking that we didn't see around disciplines uh, prior to the standards. Um, it is a responsibility of the state to, to find tools that uh, can help teachers work through these issues. Um, the implications of this are pretty tremendous if we begin to think about uh, what might happen uh, in terms of teaching and learning process. It means we're going to have to individualize learning uh, much more directly than we have in the past because students are going to be everywhere on that continuum of knowledge and skills, and we weren't measuring that before. Um, a lot more personalized. We're go it's it's going to change the relationship between teachers and other teachers, uh, and they'll have they'll a lot have to be a lot more teaming because you got to pay attention to how students move through the system. Uh, it'll mean uh, a redesigned professional uh, uh, development process in this country, which is sorely needed. Uh, I think we're about in the verge of measuring against that. What kinds of assessments are going to be possible? That's kind of scary. One of the regrettable points is that we rolled out teacher evaluation at the same time we were rolling out the standards and the teaching and learning process. That's unfair to teachers. Uh, so we're going to have to sequence that better than we have in the past. Just a number of implications you've raised that are really important. So a lot of people are aware of this. We're beginning to see publishers redesign their, their textbook materials. They are not aligned with these expectations generally. Uh, we're beginning to see some folks with technology expertise jump into this, entrepreneurs who are willing to develop tools for uh, students and teachers and learning. Um, so um, these are exciting developments. They're still in early stages, and uh, there's a lot more to do. 
I think that's it, right? Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Maybe Gene will uh, be able to stay around 24 hours when Ryan Alessi sits down with the gubernatorial candidates tomorrow afternoon. He could probably use one of these microphones. Our next session uh, builds on uh, what uh, Gene just described, his discussion. Uh, this uh, session, uh, James Allen, who is the CEO of Hilliard Lines uh, in Louisville, he presents the business case for higher academic standards. Uh, Jim is a, a lifer at Hilliard Lines. He joined the firm in 1981 and has served uh, as president since 2003. He also uh, has the title of, of chair. Uh, he also chairs the Jefferson County Public Education Foundation. He's involved in a number of educational initiatives uh, in uh, Louisville and across the state. He serves on the advisory board at uh, the University of Louisville School of Business and uh, at uh, Bellarmine's uh, University's uh, Board of Trustees. He uh, is also uh, on the executive committee of 55,000 Degrees, which is a, uh, a Jefferson County initiative that some of you uh, may be familiar with. Uh, in 2013, uh, Jim received the Kentucky Board of Education's Joseph W. Kelly Award for promoting school improvement. Uh, we would uh, like for him to come up. He'll be joined a little bit later with uh, another uh, session um, speaker, and we'll have a good discussion of higher academic standards. Please welcome James Allen. Thank you, Bill, and good afternoon, everybody. It was actually uh, May 24th of 2012 when we held a session at Hilliard Lions that involved 60 plus business leaders from around the state. And it was actually at the initiative of the uh, state chamber along with the Pritchard Committee to sort of rally the state around this idea of higher academic standards. And so that's when we really kicked it off in terms of engaging business leaders to be part of this. Of course, there was uh, uniform acceptance in that group of the importance of education. And I think since then, we've only seen educational initiatives expand. And uh, there's so many more things going on and resources being allocated in this direction. At that time, there was agreement that our students need to be better prepared for both college and career. There was also a consensus that we had a mismatch between how our students are prepared and the job skills needed for an evolving economy. In a recent Kentucky uh, Chamber survey, it was uh, determined that 28% of those responding cited a mismatch between K through 12 education and the skills needed in the workplace. Just ask small business owners. Small business, which accounts for more than 90% of private sector employment across the country, has been frustrated with work workforce uh, they regard as lacking communication, mathematical, and problem solving skills. In another survey uh, by the Alliance for Excellent Education, less than half the employers agreed that new employees had the training they needed. Not surprisingly, more than half a million manufacturing jobs across the country are vacant uh, because they are not enough qualified candidates to fill them. Uh, furthermore, a high percentage of students who enter college require remedial courses in English or mathematics, and that among those entering two-year colleges, an even higher percentage require m remedial instruction in English, math, or both. This remedial education imposes significant costs on students and their families, and it has an even greater impact on taxpayers and colleges across the country. So Kentucky was among the first, if not the first, to implement the Common Core for the 2011-2012 school year. Standards are based on college and workforce needs assessment and were benchmarked internationally, as we just heard. The Common Core allows for local decision making. Curriculum is not governed by the federal government. It is developed at the state and local level. The standards provide a framework for learning expectations. They do not dictate curriculum. The Kentucky Board of Education is responsible for establishing standards in the various content areas. Local school boards, administrators, and teachers are responsible for determining how to teach the standards, including selection of instructional materials and instructional practices. 
A recent poll by Kentucky School Board, uh, by Con K the Kentucky School Boards Association, revealed that more than 90% of the school boards support Common Core. Another state survey indicates that 97% of the teachers are teaching curriculum aligned with the Common Core. As we approach the end of the 2011-2012 school year, that kickoff meeting on May 24, 2012, we wanted to bring the business leaders together uh, acknowledging that implementation of the higher standards associated with the Common Core might create the perception that students were taking a step backwards uh, as the bar was raised and as they received test scores on their various proficiency exams. Test scores did in fact drop initially under the Common Core because of the standard uh, change from basic profici proficiency to college and career readiness, which demands more of our students. One of the benefits of the new standards and testing is better correlation with other standardized tests like the ACT. Standards determine the basics of what stu students need to learn, not how or she, he or she learns it. Kentucky is making progress. Our statewide high school graduation rate was 86.1% in 2013, which was actually fourth in the nation. That actually improved to 87.4% in 2014. In terms of college and career readiness, that rate in 2014 was 62 and a half percent. That means that students are ready to take uh, college courses that are credit bearing. Uh, what's encouraging is that that 62 and a half percent number for 2014 was an improvement from 54.1 in 2013 and 47.2 in 2012. As you heard, I'm involved with the Jefferson County Public Schools through being chairman of the Public Education Foundation here. Within JCPS, uh, college and career ready progress is closely tracking the data at the state level with 60.5% in 2014 being college and career ready, up from 51.3% in 2013 and up from 45.2% in 2012. I think the economic and business case is really self-explanatory and compelling. Because the standards are more rigorous and aligned with college and career expectations, students are less likely to need re remediation in college, courses that cost money but don't count toward a degree. Students who don't have to take these remedial courses are more likely to complete college and earn a degree. Progress is being made and the data supports that position. I think it's important uh, to look at raising academic standards through the Common Core as not a silver bullet solution, but an important piece of the puzzle in our quest to improve college and career readiness with the ultimate contribution to, an, to our economic vitality through a better prepared workforce. As, as, Donna Doctor, as Do Dr. Donna Hargens said to me a week ago, and I think she attributed this quote to someone else, this is the Common Core and the new standards are not the ceiling but we're just re-establishing a new floor at a higher level. I think it behooves us to stay this course, stay focused, stick together as business leaders. Let's face it, we can make meaningful progress if we just, we, excuse me, let's face it, we can't make meaningful progress if we just look to our educators. We need to work together with our educators to get it done. Thank you all very much for this opportunity. I'll ask uh, Bridget Blom Ramsey to uh, make her way up to the uh, microphone, uh, to the stage. Uh, Bridget is the executive director of the Pritchard Committee for Academic Ex Excellence here in Kentucky. Uh, prior to joining the Pritchard Committee in uh, May of 2014, she was the director of public policy for the United Way of Greater Cincinnati uh, with a special focus on early childhood policy. She served six years on the Kentucky uh, Board of Education and uh, she was uh, elected vice chair of the board in her last year. She also has 10 years on the Pendleton County School Board. She holds an undergraduate degree from Northern Kentucky University and a master's degree in public policy from the University of Kentucky. Would you join me in welcoming Bridget to the mic? And Bridget, if you will, I'm just going to ask you um, to uh, comment on what uh, Gene Wilhoyt had to say in his report and what Mr. Allen also had to say. Thank you, Bill. Um, I think two, two important things between what, what Gene has 
able to share and what Jim shared. Um, one, the standards have increased since 2010. Um, school is more difficult, more rigorous. You can't hear me. Let me switch mics. Is that much, is that better? Okay. So let me turn this off. Um, t two important things that, that you heard from Jean and Jim, and um, they are, one, the standards increased. So school is more rigorous for our students, and that's critically important. Um, two, clearly we are making gains in student progress. So even with standards increasing, more rigor in the classroom, uh, we mentioned lots of messaging around preparing Kentucky that our students would probably, we would see some lags. Proficiency would be less than it was in the past because standards increased. But what we're seeing over the past four years with the implementation of the standards is that our students are making critical gains. So Jim mentioned the ACT results. Um, when we started with the new standards in 2010, roughly 30% of our students in the state of Kentucky were meeting benchmarks on the ACT. So they were deemed ready for college bearing coursework. Um, after four years of standards implementation last year, 37% of our students are meeting those benchmarks. So with higher standards, they're meeting those benchmarks and m more and more of them are meeting those benchmarks on the ACT. With alternative assessments that our, um, that our schools are currently using and our colleges are accepting, um, roughly 56% of our students are meeting those college benchmarks. And then on top of that, we also have multiple measures of student success, and those are, to Jim's point, the um, career-ready measures that we put into the new accountability model. So today in Kentucky, our students um, have more rigor in the classroom. They have multiple ways to show that they are ready for post-secondary life, whether that be college, university, or the workforce, and they are meeting the standards and increasingly achieving at higher levels. So we are realizing success, the standards are working, teaching and learning is changing in Kentucky's classrooms, um, and our economy will benefit as a result. This is your uh, opportunity uh, this afternoon to really uh, question uh, the experts on Common Core. I know you've read about it and you're aware of, of uh, what's going on. You may be involved in your uh, local communities, but if you have a, a question, um, we invite you to come to the microphone uh, for Bridget. Uh, I would also uh, challenge uh, Mr. Wilhoit and Mr. Allen to also challenge Bridget um, uh, with some questions uh, that they might have too, or at least to comment on some of the things that she's bringing up. So I would uh, uh, offer you uh, a microphone and we have somebody there right now. If you wouldn't mind, just identify yourself and um, please state a, a question. Uh, my name is Sam Corbett. I'm somewhat biased given that I'm a Pritchard Committee member in the uh, Executive Director of the Jefferson County Public Education Foundation. But having given that disclaimer, uh, Bridget, people have suggested that we throw the Common Core standards out, do away with them. Tell us what happens if the decision was made to do that. What would be, uh, what would be the alternative? What would be the next step? And maybe not as important, but what would that cost? Yeah. Well, um, Sam, I guess I'll, I'll go back to my background in economics and and ask all of the, the members here assembled to think about what happens when there are shocks in the markets um, and there is a lapse in consumer confidence. What happens in our markets? And I would argue the same thing happens in our schools. Um, so when we make large, massive shifts in our education system, even when we need to do that, if we continue to do that, we create massive shocks in our education system and our teachers, administrators, our students, they all struggle in the classroom as a result. Um, so if we were to say now five years into implementation of new, higher, more rigorous standards that are comparable nationally across states and internationally benchmarked, if we were to say let's throw those standards out, we're going to cause massive shocks in the schools, the districts, the communities, and the classrooms all across the state. Um, and that's going to result in lower student outcomes, arguably in my opinion, for the next generation. Um, and so I think it's really critically important that we stay the course with the current standards that have been implemented. We recognize that our students are making gains. We also recognize that our charge um, as policymakers and uh, leaders in our state, our charge is to keep our eye on continuous improvement and that requires adjustments along the way. Um, one thing, Sam, I would also bring up in response to your question um, is to make sure that everyone is aware that over the past year the Department of Education issued what they called a standards challenge. And they put every single one of the English language art and mathematics standards online 
um, for individuals, anyone, um, including schools, teachers, uh, community members, school board members, to, to get into that system and look at the standards. So if I'm interested in kindergarten and whether or not those standards are developmentally appropriate, or I'm interested in high school mathematics, I can get on, I could get on there, it's closed now, but I could get into that survey and I could make suggestions to change the standards. I needed to back that up with some evidence for why I might want to change those standards. But there's been an opportunity for Kentuckians all across the Commonwealth to really dig into those standards, better understand them, and make suggestions for changes. Another question from the audience, or as you make your way uh, to the microphone. Uh, Bridget, let me ask you, why do you think, what is it about Common Core uh, that the critics um, don't understand or are maybe uh, choosing to critique uh, at this present time. We're seeing uh, action in other states uh, far more, um, I guess, uh, vitriolic than we are, are in Kentucky, mm -hmm. uh, but still that has a way of, uh, of the trickle-down effect, uh, back to your economic theory, uh, of somehow affecting how Kentuckians think about it. So what is it about that you understand uh, their criticism might be? So Kentucky was a good two and a half, maybe even three years into implementation before we started hearing um, a loud national pushback against the standards. Um, so we had really made a lot of progress already in Kentucky. Um, I think at the time, um, nationally, uh, the Common Core State Standards Initiative had become also part of the Race to the, to the Top initiative. So many individuals did see that then, um, to Jean's point, of this kind of federal encroachment in state decision making. And so we've had to do a lot of hard work in Kentucky, but also nationally, to really help folks understand where this came from. And Jean's presentation was, was just absolutely fabulous, to really show the trajectory. Um, why did we arrive where we are today? And I think understanding that context, to go back to our high school social studies and history classes, it's so important for us to understand history and why we have arrived at the place we have. Um, and we did so because governors um, in the 90s and our chief state school officers across the, ac across the nation said we can do better for our kids and it shouldn't matter if our kids are living in eastern Kentucky, in Lexington, in California, in Vermont, it shouldn't matter. And it shouldn't matter if they're living in the United States of America and in, in Korea, in China, uh, they're doing a much better job than we are. We need to learn nationally and we need to learn internationally. Um, and so we've had to go back and do that messaging and say this really came from the ground up um, and was adopted as a national movement. Um, and, and not accept the fact or not accept the message that this has really been a federal effort when it hasn't. Yes, sir. Uh, Fred Bauman, Bauman Paper Company out of Lexington, Kentucky. What about uh, parent and guardian involvement in this process? Has there been a component to bring the family unit into this process and getting them involved? Mm -hmm. my, teach, my wife was a school teacher for seven years and I felt blessed because she taught at home as well as in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, their uh, parent involvement as a target audience, um, specifically, they've not been included in the standards development because the standards development has been part of uh, education professionals, uh, uh, target audience. But in Kentucky, it's important to remember that while we have adopted standards that are common across now many states across the nation, um, curriculum is what drives teaching and learning at the local level. Um, in Kentucky in the early 90s, we adopted a governance model that requires school-based decision-making councils in all of our schools and um, sets in place a local decision-making body in our elected boards of education. And those bodies, the school-based decision-making councils and to some degree the local boards of education have full authority over the curriculum in the classroom that allows students to reach the standards. And that is where parent involvement is critical, at the school level and in the community level to have those conversations. Um, parents, community members should all be actively involved um, to support our schools and to set high expectations in our community that we want the best for our kids. One final uh, question or, or comment from the audience and we'll take this one and, and then move on. Yes. Just a question, how do we educate legislators? There were legislators that have run recently in Kentucky 
and part of their platform was to eliminate Common Core. So my question is, what can educators, professional folks like you do, and what can we do to help them to understand the progress that has been made in Kentucky and the importance of Common Core to Kentucky businesses and just society in general? Thank you. Excellent question. Um, and I, I would encourage all of you to get to know your legislator, your, um, your House of Representative member, your state senator, and to have a conversation with them. Talk with them about how things are going in your schools. Talk with them about why you believe um, our children should have the benefit of standards that are common um, to the surrounding states and to other nations. Um, talk to them about the gains that you see in student, student um, um, progress. Um, let them know that you support the current standards and ask them to do the same. So I think it's important, um, you know, the Pritchard Committee is founded on community engagement, um, citizen-led advocacy for better, better schools, um, and that is timeless. So we all need to be involved, we all need to have conversations and ensure that our legislators, our congressmen know um, that education progress is critical. We need to stay the course and we need to continuously improve. Let me just ask you one last question or give someone a chance to, to get up with a, a final comment. Um, is this an issue that should uh, be debated in the uh, gubernatorial uh, race? And uh, if people are, if people uh, agree that it should be explained and detailed and understand where the candidates uh, speak, what would you suggest that they do uh, to uh, better inform not only their legislators but uh, the candidates who are running for office. How important is this for the future of Kentucky education? The standards, again, I think are critically important for the future of Kentucky education because we need to stay the course for our schools, for our districts, for our students, for our teachers who are, are mastering new ways of teaching and learning and facilitating student learning. Um, and our gubernatorial candidates need to understand that. So again, it's important that we all have those conversations, um, if not with a gubernatorial candidate, with policymakers in our own communities. Um, as we move into a new administration, it's gonna be Im important that we stay the course and we need to make sure that our gubernatorial candidates understand that. I would also suggest that maybe it's time for us to shift the conversation away from discussion about standards um, that are now a good five years into implementation in Kentucky and focus a little bit more on the outcomes at the community level. So how are our students really doing? Do we see that they're making progress? And if they are, let's continue to spur that progress forward and let's think about what we need to do over the next five to 10 years. When we talk about the standards, we're not talking so much about um, career readiness. Um, we're talking a lot about college readiness and that has its impact on career readiness as well. We know, you know, that the employees you're going to hire uh, need to have mastered the English language. They need to have mastered basic mathematics. Um, but the piece that is really embedded in the standards that we don't talk a lot about is this idea of deeper learning. And that means that our students not only master content, um, but they also understand and have the opportunity to apply this content. They have the access to career programs, um, to projects, to performance-based learning, and that is something that you as employers really want as a skill set in your employees. You want them to be able to come to the workplace ready to work as a team, uh, ready to think creatively, uh, able to communicate well, and these are the things that we can continue to improve under our new standards. Uh, deeper learning, career and technical education, and we need to infuse our system with the resources that will allow our teachers to take our students to that place in the classroom. Where can they go for more information on the Common Core? Uh, you can certainly go to the Pritchard Committee's website for more information on the Common Core. Um, there's also lots of information online about the standards. There are websites you can go to to look at the standards specifically. Um, the Chamber also has um, some information on the standards and the importance of the standards moving forward. Um, and we would certainly be happy to answer any questions. The Pritchard Committee would be happy to answer any questions. You can find us on the web. I'd be happy to meet with you on the side, give you my business card. Always happy to answer questions. And we do have time and one more okay. question in the back. <coughs> yes, thank you. My name is Brandon Gossett, and uh, I'm with uh, JCTC, Workforce Solutions Department. 
And uh, my question is, uh, I'm sure everyone recognizes a need for um, national standards or uh, across the board uh, standards like that. Uh, but my question is, why legislation? Why not a, a, a non-government uh, uh, accreditation body, uh, similar to some uh, post-secondary education accreditation? Why not something like that instead of uh, legislation? For, for our K-12 standards specifically? Uh, correct. Okay. Um, you know, I guess my... My answer to that from um, a public policy background would be that the legislation allows us to standardize something that we believe is, um, is critically important for all individuals of our society. So absent that standardization, um, we're going to get lots of local differences in how we deliver education and what we deliver. So back to Gene's early point in his presentation, um, that's what we had years ago. Um, when states were developing their own standards, absent any um, concerted and unified effort, everyone was doing their own thing. Um, so at the time, as a local board of education member with young children of my own, um, I was concerned that while Kentucky had accountability and we had standards and they were mandated through a legislative process, um, my children may not stay in the state of Kentucky to go to college or to work. And it, what assurance did I have that what they were learning in Kentucky schools was going to be comparable to what they might learn in Ohio, Tennessee, West Virginia, California, Vermont? Um, and I wanted that assurance as, um, as a parent and as a local board of education member that we were doing everything in our power to ensure that our students, as they grow up, can not only be competitive in our Kentucky economy, but can be competitive in a national economy and now a growing global economy. So I think legislation is what gets us to standardization. And when we talk about the standards, um, that's critically important. But again, we have to remember that curriculum, teaching and learning in the classroom um, happens at the local level. Um, so Stu Silverman, our current executive director at the Pritchard Committee, has an excellent example when he talks about standards and curriculum and the difference. Um, and he will share with you that he is uh, severely directionally challenged. Um, so I'm not saying anything he wouldn't say. Um, and, you know, he shares that standards are much like um, all of us using our phone or GPS to get us where we need to go. Um, and, you know, we, we put in Marriott, Louisville, Kentucky in our phone, and it may give us three different routes to get there. The standard is I want to get to the Marriott in Louisville, Kentucky. The curriculum is the three different ways that I can use to get there. And so that is up to our teachers and our administrators in our local districts. Um, so there is standardization through the standards and legislation, but we still have lots of local input, and I think that's where we get to maybe the concern that was addressed. Let's uh, thank Bridget <laughs> and Jean Wilhoyt and Mr. Allen. Thanks very much.